So I would propose that, uh, well, we have a, a good 40 minutes for discussion, so we already tackle a, a number of, of issues. I would start by um, um, asking the audience whether you have a, what you may call technical or specific questions for any of the speakers. And then once we are done with that, we can go to more general discussion around the points that I have put there as a proposition. We are welcome to propose other things as well. But you know, let's start by uh, making sure that um, whatever specific technical question on the uh, projects or the, on, on the work uh, that has uh, been reported today um, uh, and that you may have is um, raised. So, any question for any of the few speakers? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so, uh, your claim that more letters means faster evolution. Uh, it is partially, I understand that this is well, partially joke, partially, but it's a very serious question. Because more complexity means more flexibility once, but higher dimensions that are long, longer optimization. But do you have any idea what is the optimal number of letters for fast evolution? Seven. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> no, any idea? <laughs> you no, know, it's four. Yeah, actually. So, uh, my my hypothesis is four. Actually, I think four. <laughs> me too, me too. Me too. <laughs> this Not is seven. A, <laughs> Not seven. Okay, this is a question that I would, I would uh, like to return later uh, in the general discussion. <laughs> Any other specific technicalities? Yeah, is that right? Yes, yeah, so I would uh, like to ask Morgan about his self free systems that he is investing in so much because it's very interesting. So, the, you mentioned the Bacillus Megaterium. Uh, self free extract is that uh, so, so? What are the advantages? What kind of protein yields are you getting out of that? Um, I think our strategy was to essentially take a lot of organisms that we think are have utility. So Megaterium has been proposed as a potential organism for industrial production of proteins. And I guess we just wanted to have some sort of comparator that we could compare, you know, E. coli, Bacillus Megaterium, Bacillus subtilis, <coughs> Pseudomonas putata, that um, our chairman is very uh, interested in, mm. and other types of organisms, and, and then just try and get some understanding about is there any correlation between how they, you know, the, the, the organism or phenotype, if you like, and how the cell extract behaves? It's a really ridiculous question, I realise, but it's just a sort of interesting question, you know, and so if we can do it really quantitatively, we might find some interesting uh, differences. So Megaterium does seem to have, so it could be, you know, the number of ribosomes, it could be the um, efficiencies of some of the translation mm -hmm. processes between, so, uh, who knows, I don't know what the answer is, but the idea is to try and explore that uh, in a more systematic way. But, but you know, typically you right now see that it behaves better than the other extracts, or it's just yeah, it, it certainly to it break. certainly starts to produce more of our of our standard protein GFP. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, it, it does under the same you know in the same conditions and the same volumes. Blah, blah, blah. But we have there is one thing I have to mention is that cell free extracts are quite heterogeneous, and you need to optimize them um, uh, for some some quite strange um, parameters. One is the potassium ion concentration as well as the magnesium ion concentration. So there's obviously some solvation going on, there's some strange uh, behavior within, each, within the extract for it to, I'm talking about the function, I'm re the readout is transcription translation, that's our readout. Uh, and for that to be effective, you have to optimize the extract using these uh, particular ions. Um, I'm not clear why, it'd be very interesting, and it's clearly something to do with solvation, but we haven't well, ATP needs to be used. Sure, right. but, but it, it varies from extract to extract, <coughs> from organism to organism. How do you break those cells off? Is it like uh, detergent-based, uh, uh, mechanical? Yeah, mechanical, uh, we'd usually use uh, sonication. Yeah, yeah so, but, this, but uh, sorry, the optimization seems to vary from extract to extract, from organism to organism, so, and even from batch to batch, so obviously there's, you know, heterogeneity. One more question there. I have a question for the shield. Now that you start to look after therapy, will you test your monomers for cellular toxicity? Um, yeah, we check with it. Um, yeah, we just we we have just done the uh, cell toxicity, and in this case, uh, it not uh, maybe uh, not so big uh, toxicity. Without it, it shows. It. I had a question for Paul for your Turbo Sigma 70 promoter that doesn't that performs in vitro but not in yeah. vivo. 
Is this related to RNA levels or protein levels? Did you check in vitro if it makes... Yeah, it's a good question. We're doing that now. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. <laughs> uh, it's, um, the only thing I can say about these series of synthetic promoters we made, uh, there are very small differences between them, and this one is a small difference. So, um, we'd be very interested to know exactly the question you've, you've raised, and also the context issue as well. But, um, sorry, I haven't got the data yet. Just following on from that, um, have you thought about using that promoter in vivo as a readout and then doing a mutagenesis to find out what's holding it back? That's a good question. No, we haven't. That's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. No, we should do that. That's interesting. Thank you. Okay, great. So once we are done with these technicalities, I would like to invite you, and not just to raise questions, but also to actively participate in this more general discussion that is connected to um, some of the topics that have been raised by the speakers and by myself. So uh, let me just fire by raising the issue of standards. We have heard about the importance of standards. Standards have been one of the tenets in security biology, the the IGEM, all these uh, things. So, um, but the standards at the same time, when you talk about uh, when you, when you talk um, about them to our colleagues, at least that's my experience, people don't get precisely very, very excited about that, right? So everyone recognizes that it's an important thing, but no one is really very willing to put effort and money into developing with the standards, and so that's one aspect. The other aspect is that if you look at the history of standards, and I was joking before, um, standards in many cases have been adopted by um, what you may call bottom-up initiatives, but in many cases they have been implemented by brute force, and I think that the case of Napoleon is a good one. So uh, the reason why we enjoy um, uh, the metric system in the continent and partially in the UK as well is because of Napoleon, you know, because that, uh, be before that there was a whole chaos of um, uh, standards for measurement and stuff like that. So, um, I mean, how do you see uh, this um, topic developing? I mean, do you find that this is really important when I was uh, listening to you, I was thinking, well, maybe you don't care a lot. Uh, I mean, you don't care at all about the standards. You do things and you ignore whatever um, you know standard may be involved with that, and you are perfectly happy with that. In other cases, other people may um, claim that the standards are bottlenecks. So unless we have a common standard for doing things, there are some areas of biology and technology that will never develop. So what is your sentiment? What is your feeling about that? So maybe uh, Paul can start advocating standards, and maybe others may. Um, uh, um, no, I, I'm a great proponent of technical standards. I mean, the, the thing we've got to differentiate, I think, is a little bit between standards, as in the ISO, International Standard Organization Certification, and the sort of thing I think we need now, which is more agreed set of technical standards among the community of how you measure things, actually. And I would pin it down onto that metrology. So I just think it's, you know, when we measure something in one lab and we measure it in another lab, can we ensure that the measurements are, you know, comparable uh, and even in biology I think we, we don't we don't really push that envelope too much you know we're, we're better than we were but I think you know that so for example I would like if someone's doing a fax analysis I'd like to know what the gates are what the, the whole metadata associated with the measurement very tedious stuff a lot of biologists are interested in that but I think if we're going to get this kind of quantitative comparative sense of measurement uh, and standard processes and standard operating processes then we're going to have to push that forward it's, you know assuming we want to make this field a a kind of engineering type field because I can't see how they can progress without that. I don't think we could have an engineering field without standards, personally. Yes, Eric. Yeah, so I, I've been involved with standardization <coughs> and I, I, for a long time. So I have, some, I have several things to, to say there, but I just would like to say so measurement is obviously one domain that is extremely important, but that's kind of general science. You want to have reproducibility in your, in your papers and so on. I think what we have to look for is not standardization as a, as a purpose in itself, obviously, which has sometimes happened a little bit, but really try to find those points where we want to exchange things. So, I mean, I think a standard is some like an interface where you start doing something, and I can then take it and continue it, and then somebody else can again continue it. Those, those crossover points. This, those are the ones that we have to identify, uh, and this is what we should standardize right now. And I think measurement is one of those. Uh, the exchange of designs is another one. Like the information that goes into the paper that we publish is still, usually it's still like a really big pain to actually identify the sequences, the DNA sequences that go with all those nice synthetic biology papers. And I think that's a little bit embarrassing. 
And uh, so that's something that the ESPOL community, where I'm involved, is, is working on. But also the ESPOL community kind of lost track of that a little bit because they then <coughs> focus a lot on systems biology modeling and like the higher level, but the very basic level, I think this is what we should go for, like basic problems like I have a paper, I have five or ten or five hundred plasmids that are described there, and we have to make sure that I get this design out again and can use it. And then I make a measurement and I want to make sure that I can actually reproduce this measurement. So I think those are the things we should focus okay, on. Okay, so let's have briefer intervention so we have a more dynamic uh, discussion. Thank you, uh, right? So one more uh, comment and then we move to the next topic. <coughs> um, it's, uh, I agree and I disagree with uh, Philippe that so if I want to understand biology, I am against the standard. It's a way to block the uh, innovation and, and I think the living organism is exactly what you said, that exists today, it's because they are not standardized at all. Okay. If from a, an engineer point of view, if I want to propose a, a product to uh, uh, the population, or if I want to make something, I need standard. So if I am a scientist, I don't want standard. I don't want to be uh, blocked by any kind of standardization. I am, if I am an engineer, I want standard. Okay, so I think that you can see the entire landscape of opinions. I think they are very, very, very good. Um, you know, my, 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 own, my own take is that we should concentrate uh, for a time being in metrology to really have good standards for measurement of things that still is very weak in biology. So, yes, one second. We have one. It's, just, it's not a comment, it's, it's a question for, for you. Uh, do you say that uh, this problem of establishing standards is it a technical problem because it's very difficult? Uh, it's a human problem? <coughs> care or don't bother? Or is it more a, a, a conceptual problem? You, you have to understand deeper to uh, your field <coughs> to be able to. To, to establish those standards, and you, and so it's the link between what this person said. Um, it's too early for him, and it's that it can come together, huh? I, I mean, I think the word standards is off-putting. Victor said, and maybe we should not. It's, I'm not. Standards mean something to everyone differently. Right? <laughs> to me, standards, to me, I'm talking about technical standards, te reproducibility, standard operating processes. That's all I'm talking about. So reproducibility, so I know that if I follow exactly everything you did in that paper, I'm going to be able to reproduce that measurement. And to be truthful, in a lot of biological research, that is not the case now. So we've got to move from that. In terms of the, it is a human thing, of course it's a human thing, because it means I, I've got to persuade my postdocs and students to, to, to put down all that ridiculous extra bit of data called metadata about the measurement. I've got to go and do it, replicate, do it you know, multiple times under different conditions. It's really tough. So that's why automation, I think, is the way forward. So a lot of our labs are developing automatic <coughs> platforms for characterizing promoters and parts so we can have throughput, automation and standard measurement. I'm talking about the engineering of biology here, so it's not about blue sky biology because that's different. That's completely unencumbered by anything you want. You just go and do whatever you want. But if we're going to build a, a, a synthetic biology that has applications and is going to produce a new kind of you know, way of doing biotechnology, then I think we have to have it. And, and it hasn't happened today. That's, that, that's my case. Anyway. Okay, uh, we have one more question, and that's the end of the discussion. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, I think standardization is very difficult. We, we should know that. <laughs> so because, uh, so when we just determine the DNA or protein concentration, so it's still very difficult. Do you know? <laughs> we know. <laughs> All right, so I would like to, uh, to, to take uh, the next um, point of discussion about this modularity that has been raised first by um, by Paul, but then to an extent has been raised also later. So, um, what do you think? And this is a question for the whole audience. Is biology modular as it is? Uh, can, can it be made modular? And if uh, we manage to make it modular, will, will it stay modular? I mean, the questions, uh, opinions about that? Or maybe you never thought of that. Yes. Um, I, I, I think we have to talk about modules because the if we are able to define modules, if they exist, then we can also think about standards, how to link the modules. <laughs> Otherwise, the standardization makes not a lot of sense. 
And um, if we talk about modules, and if, we, if I look at systems biology, are we able to separate organisms in modules and describe them by sets of equations and link them, I think we have not been very successful. <laughs> All right, so um, the motivation for this question is that you uh, look at the textbooks and then you see, you know, metabolism. You have this metabolic block, you have the glycolysis, you have uh, the pentose pathway, whatever, and then you have, um, you know, a DNA um, a binding proteins. Then you have this, but at the end, you know, there's a, this growing evidence that the same protein may make at the same time many, many different things. Like some proteins involved in glycolysis may at the same time bind DNA, or some protein that makes this reaction at the same time is a structural component of this other thing. So uh, even though we, our, our, our brain may, uh, may be programmed to see models all over the place and to see divisions, maybe this is something that does not happen in reality. And I think that you may agree with me that um, every time we want to have a perfect model in biology, sooner or later we run into problems. But maybe there is some hope, perhaps through xenobiology or perhaps through physical containment or because uh, with other strategies, to remake a model a reality. What, what, what do you think about that? Do you think that this is our way to go? Yes. So I think that as a biologist, when thinking about modularity, you need to consider whether the modules are insulated from the system or whether they're part of the network, as you were getting at. So if they, if they are, for example, part of primary metabolism, they're likely to be pretty well networked. Um, whereas if they are specialised metabolic pathways that are lineage specific, they may be sequestered away uh, with less. So it's the it's the um, it's the connections between the components of the module and the rest of, let's say, metabolism. So if, if there aren't any, if there are very few, you have to have your precursors. Uh, but if the specialised part is insulated, then that may be easier to deal with in a living organism than the whole of primary metabolism. All right. Our opinions? Yes. So I guess there's another term that people have used, which is orthogonality, right? So which gets to this idea, which I think Paul mentioned too, which is um, you know, whether what you design does not impact the original system when you, when you introduce it. Though I, I'm not entirely sure that's necessarily the modularity that you were discussing in terms of parts, but in terms of the systems, whether the, the uh, design component has no effect on the non-design component, which is the, the organism itself and so on. Very good. More comments? Do you want to share your, your thoughts with you? Do you want to share your thoughts with us? No, I'm just saying, so it's partly a mathematical question. This is a flow of information and flow of material from part to part. If there's definite customization for this network, we can call the model. If not, there is no model. Right? And you know that say, in the brain there are modules that are connections in certain regions much denser than some others. In reality, you raise the problem of orthogonality, and orthogonality, along with the standards and other magic words, are one of the preferred terms in synthetic biology. I mean, is orthogonality a, a, a realistic objective, or we will always run into this massive connectivity between different bits and parts? So I think modularity is a reasonable goal, and the only way to get somewhere is to start addressing it and trying to make things modular, because that's where we're going to learn things that we didn't previously see when we weren't looking for this goal of isolation or orthogonality. Um, but the, the counter to that is, is if we make things completely modular and remove orthogonality, remove those um, uh, networking connections, we're also going to inherently make the system even more complex and less efficient. So after we build in that modularity, we're going to have to build back in efficiencies once we completely understand it, if we can ever get there. So there's sort of a... Um, I think the reason nature is not so modular is because it has to be more efficient than what we are aiming for right now. But would you argue that one of the ways to get into this modularity would be to use your approach to really isolate physically whatever biological components you have at hand? Physically? I, that's, yeah. that's my personal goal, yes, is to, to isolate it in that way. Okay, so, yes. I'm sorry, I came back because the example of capsid is an example of modularity. So we have a face. We have 150 faces, and you connect with the same brick, one brick only, you connect everything and you do a complex object. So this is an example of modularity. My question before is to know, 
if this modularity is imprinted in DNA or not, or is it epigenetic phenomenon? That is my main question. Um, I, I think we like to believe that it's completely imprinted in DNA, but it's also controlled by many other things, like yeah, you were saying, the salt concentrations, or so the information is there, but we also need environmental conditions to merge. Quickly, Rick? Yeah, I think that this discussion came, comes up a lot. Basically, nature is, in, I mean, biology is incredibly modular, I think, because otherwise none of this genetic engineering that we have been doing in 30 years would have ever worked by taking a gene from one organism, putting it into another organism, and actually getting a product out. So it, it, it's clear that at some level there is an amazing amount of modularity because we can do that. It's not a perfect modularity, but even a computer that we have engineered is not perfectly modular because all those, all those circuits on the chip, even though they're very modular in the layout, they all depend on each other with, with the MPS, uh, with, the, with the current that they're using and so on. So, I mean, even in perfectly engineered modular human systems, this modularity is never perfect. So, obviously, in biology, it's even less perfect because there's this, as, as you said, there's this tendency to integrate things, to make them more efficient, but then evolution tends to break them apart again, and that's exactly what we're looking at. So it's a continuum between, it's definitely not a perfectly integrated system, it's definitely not a perfectly modular system, but it's modular enough to have a starting point. That's what we should Okay, so I look at the clock and we have just a few minutes left, and I would like to finish without raising uh, what I find a very, very interesting discussion on genetic alphabets. And that was initiated before, but I would like to get more feedback from you and from the speakers. So, um, uh, I mean, how far we can go in uh, developing new alphabets, in the sense of developing new functions and new f uh, life forms and so on, or it happens that evolution has found a kind of optimum, and that's it. So, uh, wait, 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 <laughs> let me, I mean, okay, so the idea is, uh, I mean, by having, um, you know, the, the uh, Phoenician alphabet has uh, 20 few letters, uh, the Latin alphabet has 28, and you know, Chinese alphabet has many more. Um, uh, okay, well, whatever. So, uh, well, in, in yeah, other yeah, yeah, okay, so the, 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 the question is, by having more letters, can we write different stories? And, and that, to, to, to me, what, what is important, you know? Uh, because maybe, uh, you know, the, the opinion is to have a small number of letters, and with that, uh, to make a combination of them, and with that, you have enough to write all types of histories from the Iliad all the way to the latest novel. So by having a different alphabet, can we write different things? Well, or... no, is is all right, okay, right, yeah. all right. So, wait, 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 wait. So, uh, those that are more engaged into this type of developing new alphabets, can you say your opinions? No. I don't know. Um, you can do Iliad that... with zeros and ones. Exactly. So it's... You can do okay. everything. Can we hear from those that have developed new letters for the genetic alphabet? So, um... I'll defer to it, Cheryl. Okay, please. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, actually, I don't know because. Um, no, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. You have to say something. But, but, yeah, through my experiments, so on Earth, um, four base and uh, 20 amino acids is the best one. Well, 23, you know? It's more, a little more than 20. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. But uh, so it, it depends on the maybe fidelity. So. That is very important. So, uh, uh, if we make a DNA, uh, so replication, uh, it's, uh, so in this case, so 20 amino acid polymerase is important. So, and in this case, maybe the fidelity is, uh, a present fidelity is the best one. So, that's why we, so our so letters are limited for. So, if we add the amino acid more than 20, so maybe we can much more. Uh, higher fidelity as polymerase, so that we can improve it. So. All right, more opinions. I have the following question. Do you have, do you have a, a, a new alphabet? You make cope with this alphabet a huge amount of information. You produce something like the, a DNA system, but it lives in an environment. Therefore, it has, you cannot take it off from that, because you have to transfer this information, it must be re uh, transferred in reaction with the environment. And therefore you couldn't use any uh, 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 any chemicals or substances putting up an al 
alphabet. You had before what kind of uh, uh, pieces of alphabet for your alphabet? Was it parts of DNA or what was it? What what were were, were the substances you used for your for your uh, 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 system? Uh, <coughs> the precursors that give rise to the alter mm -hmm. base, the chemical precursors. Yeah. What did you use? I mean, this must be uh, uh, compatible with the environment, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah, I think so our natural gases cannot make uh, from the nature, so just completely man-made. So, so that, that's the difference from uh, natural gases. You had a natural basis. The natural gas is, uh, yeah, it's a, a, a some biology <laughs> theory. <laughs> so, so, uh, actually, I don't know, but uh, so natural gas is uh, maybe uh, can make uh, or on us or uh, from the universe. So, okay. All right. Yes, one more. Like to, a couple of uh, short comments. Real quick question. Maybe someone should run the experiment where they put the unnatural nucleotides in and see if they can evolve better afterwards. Exactly. That's, a, well, that's exactly the, the these uh, questions are uh, addressable experimentally. Now, uh, okay, uh, organisms with additional amino acids or with uh, additional bases or challenge amino acids or whatever, they could be uh, put in competition with wild type species or whatever. Another experiment which would be very, uh, you know, there is something in uh, computer science called restrict, restricted instruction set computers. So that you try to restrict and modularize and so on. It would be very interesting to try to, to, to attempt to make organisms with an amino acid less, not more, less to see whether and put to the to the to the test the notion that the more the the, the bigger the alphabet, the more evolutionary and adaptive options we believe so, but it is not proven, but it is experimentally tractable. Yeah, indeed, I, th I think these are entirely fascinating question and also. Uh, the other question of how to reduce the alphabet yes. and what happens when you reduce it. And I know that some of you are working on that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think that that was just, uh, we have just enunciated. Uh, is there any super... Yeah, okay, very, very last one. No, I, ju I just wanted to say it depends what you want to do with the alphabet. If you want to include information, zero and zeros and ones, it's enough in principle. It's just the string gets very long. But if you want functions, if you want these things to fold up into three-dimensional shapes, I think it's pretty clear, there's also classic experiments from Jerry Joyce lab, that if you reduce the alphabet from four to three to one, the functionality drops, and the Jerry Israel suggests, certainly, there's a first glimpse that if you increase the alphabet, the, yeah. functionality, the functional potential, the adaptability goes up. So Very good one point. has to distinguish between those. Great. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we have to um, maintain the program in time or less. So we have some time now for refreshment, but I would like to uh, close without uh, thanking the, uh, the speakers.